I planned on doing this at some point in the future, but the way that everything has happened, I think that now is the time when it's most needed. So you know the drill. We take a topic, in this case gun control, we go through all the arguments, we refute them, and then people get mad in that order. So please do stay tuned for this one because, yeah, it's a lot of fun, but it's also really important because the Second Amendment is what guarantees all of our other rights. So you're going to want to stick around for this one, my personal opinion. John Doyle in. Heck off, commie. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Heck Off, commie. High energy today. Uh, take a second, follow me on Twitter if you haven't already. And as always, there's going to be timestamps in the description for each argument. But other than that, we will get started. But I do, I want to know something first that I think is unique about this debate. And this is something I've said for a while, which is that um, this issue is the most stress-inducing issue to debate because with almost every other issue, I would say that each side has a general idea of what they're talking about, even if it's limited or incoherent. I'd say they generally have an understanding, not with guns. Not with gun control. These people literally have no idea what they're talking about. And so as a result of that, some of what we're going to be talking about is inevitably going to focus on cutting through some of this white noise that they create. You know, things like, well, automatic assault weapons. I saw a woman on Twitter refer to an AK-47 as a weapon of mass destruction. Things like that. Things that just make you go like, <laughs> like, come on. But, um... I think this is rooted in the leftist tendency to not want to acknowledge human nature. They don't want to believe that people are not inherently good. They don't want to believe in individual responsibility. And we can see how this manifests for them all over the policy cork board, but they're afraid of guns. They're afraid of accepting responsibility for their own safety as a part of personal responsibility. And this, of course, corresponds with their preference for a larger government that provides more to them, thereby eliminating personal responsibility on their part to a certain degree. Um, similarly to how they can't accept that if an individual is in a poor circumstance, that individual ultimately, with very few exceptions, is responsible for that, but they'll maintain that no, 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 that's impossible. Difference of outcome is inherently unjust, therefore the state must get involved to fix it, and it all lines up for them. Because it's not that they're against guns. What they're against is gun ownership in the hands of the individual, because guns in the hands of the individual requires responsibility. And so they want to outsource that entirely to the state, and the state is, of course, going to need guns to disarm its citizens, and since the ultimate result of the state is coercion at gunpoint, you've put all of your trust and all of the power in the hands of very few people trusting that they will be virtuous instead of deconcentrating that power in the hands of the individuals, where if they were to act not virtuously, they would be stopped by other entities that are virtuous. Whereas if the state begins to act not virtuously, there is no entity left to correct that behavior because you've concentrated all absolute power in the state. And history has shown what that does. Hundreds of millions of dead bodies. But I also think it's important to understand from where we are embarking in this discussion, I guess I would say. And so obviously, we have a right to bear arms as guaranteed by the Second Amendment of our Constitution. Everyone knows that. What some people seem to not know or not understand or ignore, whatever. The actual non-abstract significance of what a right entails. A right is the opposite of a privilege. A privilege is defined, roughly speaking, as grants that you receive on a conditional basis that can be revoked. This would be your driver's license, to give an example. Complete opposite of a right. A right is an inherent, irrevocable entitlement held by all citizens for their entire life. It cannot be undermined. It isn't a privilege where conditions must be met. It is a right. Binarily different. Shall not be infringed. It's right there in the text of the Second Amendment. And since we know that to infringe means to violate an agreement, we can therefore conclude that every law that restricts civilian access to firearms is an infringement. Every gun law is an infringement, to quote libertarian Instagram accounts. And this is where we're arguing from. And frankly, that's the only argument that matters. We'll go through all the most common, you know, little arguments, whatever. But the debate has been settled. It was settled in 1791. There's not supposed to be any infringing upon our Second Amendment right unless it's done constitutionally through ratification. But of course, that's not what's being proposed. And there are arguments against the constitutional legitimacy of our Second Amendment right. Don't argue with anything. Those are the only important arguments. They're the only legitimate arguments because unless you can successfully make the case that the Constitution is an illegitimate authority, you're toast. Nothing else you say matters, to be honest, because it's my right. And unless you can substantiate why that right should go away, nothing else you say about guns is of any importance to anyone ever in America. We're one of three countries that recognize a right to bear arms in our Constitution. That's spectacular. There are people protesting in Hong Kong right now. They say they wish they had a Second Amendment. And again, there's two schools of thought. Because I can walk into a coffee shop with a rifle slung across my body, and the left is like, well, I can't believe you can do that! And the right is like, I can't believe I can do that. It's epic. But it's important to recognize the truth behind those reactions is that both sides of the aisle recognize that the right to bear arms is basically uniquely American. But the difference is that one side celebrates this while the other side resents this, but they both recognize it. And so... 
Now we'll actually get into the arguments, and I want to start with the ones that have to do with the Constitution and the Founding Fathers, all that good stuff, because like I said, those are the only legitimate arguments. So we'll start with everyone's favorite. Second Amendment was intended for militias, not civilians. They were supposed to be well-regulated, etc. Like I said, these first arguments about the actual constitutional validity are the most important, and so we'll probably spend the most time going through these, but this is an argument in favor of a legal theory that's referred to as the narrow individual right theory, which is basically that the Second Amendment protects an individual's right to have a firearm, provided that it's in connection to service in a well-regulated militia. This is the opposite of how we would interpret the Second Amendment. It's also the opposite of how the Supreme Court does interpret the Second Amendment, as of 2008 in the District of Columbia versus Heller ruling. And the reason that it took until 2008 for the Supreme Court to affirm that the Second Amendment was intended for individuals and individual purposes such as self-defense is because this interpretation was understood to be the correct interpretation until the early to mid 20th century, which is when the collective right interpretation started to surface in the lower courts throughout the country. And we know this because early American thought on the right to bear arms was essentially concerned with two ideas, and those were the right of the individual to keep and bear arms to implement their core right to self-defense, and also a focus on militias being the only safe defense of a free society. And the English perception on an individual's right to bear arms arose out of a 17th century reversal of policy course, because prior to the Stuart dynasty in England, the English government actually forced their subjects to own and use arms. All healthy male subjects were required to own arms appropriate to the time period and their wealth. Towns were required to construct shooting ranges, and games other than marksmanship were actually outlawed because because they wanted to ensure that Englishmen would only have one legal sport. And so this armed population eventually became known as the militia, and they were organized under royal officials, which would be the Lord's Lieutenant. And so the Stuart Kings eventually reversed these policies after becoming stressed over the growing instability under their rule. They had the Militia Act of 1662, which authorized the Lord's Lieutenant or their deputies to disarm anyone that they might, quote, judge dangerous to the peace of the kingdom. They had the Game Act of 1671, which forbade all but the wealthiest landowners to possess firearms. And they justified this by claiming that, oh, it's to prevent poaching. Okay. But uh, James II, in particular, tried to enforce these measures. For example, a 1686 order that informed the Lord's Lieutenant that James had heard that, quote, a great many persons not qualified by law under pretense of shooting matches keep muskets or other guns in their houses, and then he ordered them to cause strict search to be made for such muskets or guns to seize and safely keep till further order. And James ended up, he was overthrown in the Revolution of 1688. He was succeeded by William and Mary. Parliament then drafted a Declaration of Rights, which the new monarchs were required to accept before taking the throne. And this declaration was a minimalist guarantee of rights. Only the most ancient and indubitable English rights were spelled out. Uh, free speech was protected only in Parliament, but freedoms of the press, of assembly, of religion, they were nowhere mentioned. But among the core rights protected was that of arms. They wrote, quote, the subjects which are Protestant may have arms for their defense suitable to their conditions and as allowed by law. And the individual nature of this right was extremely clear, not only from the text, but from the history behind it. The parliamentary debates had centered around the individual disarmaments under the 1662 Militia Act, and early drafts of this focused on the keeping and providing of arms for the, quote, common defense, but they were dropped in favor of an individual rights guarantee. So given this context in English law, it's not at all surprising that during the, the American Revolution, the British kept complaining because Americans were stockpiling arms, to which Sam Adams replied by posting a public notice that said, quote, it is a natural right which the people have reserved to themselves, confirmed by the Bill of Rights, to keep arms for their own defense, and as Mr. Blackstone observes, it is to be made of use when the sanctions of society and law are found insufficient to restrain the violence of oppression, end quote. That all sounds pretty damning to the argument that the founders were referring to militias, but we'll talk about that too. So we talked about the first part, which was the individual rights component, and now we'll talk about the second part, which is the militia part. And so from their start, the American colonies required that all adult males, and sometimes even adult females, if they were the heads of the household, to possess arms. And some statues exempted people from militia training, but they still required that they possess arms. And so you have to understand, this was at a time where they were facing attacks from the Native Americans, from the rival French, Spanish, and Dutch colonists. And so the militia concept was practical. Intellectually speaking, it was written about by writers such as James Harrington that argued that the militia was the only safe and effective defense of a free people because any professional army will either be too weak to defend the people or strong enough to take control over the people and their property, whereas a militia composed of voters and property owners could be as powerful as it desired without posing a risk to government or property because its members were the people who controlled both. And so the generation that framed the Constitution had both components that linked individual arms ownership to freedom because you had the right to bear arms as a means of individual self-defense and you had the right to bear arms as a means of collective self-defense. And so with the District of Columbia versus Heller ruling in 2008, the court ruled 5-4 in favor of the individual right theory. And that's because they reviewed all the relevant information and it led them to legally conclude what the country already knew, which is that the Second Amendment protects an individual's right to bear arms. And before then, the federal courts had maintained this collective right theory that it wasn't 
wasn't intended for individual rights, but actually talking about either the right of the state to have militia systems or the rights of individuals to bear arms when engaging in state organized militia activities. And this totally collapsed in the 2008 ruling because and then again in McDonald versus uh, City of Chicago because the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the individual rights for individual purposes view. And then more interesting, they struck down this collective rights theory that had prevailed in three circuit courts. And they, they, like, they killed it 9-0. And so people regard this ruling, oh, there's a radical change in how we regard the Second Amendment. But when placed in its historical context, not really. It just becomes clear that this ruling returned the interpretation to its original interpretation from the framing of the Bill of Rights onward, this view for individual rights, individual purposes, held in every venue, be it the courts, commentators, Congress, like this collective right view didn't even gain acceptance into the federal courts until the 1940s. And it didn't become widespread until the 1970s. And so by the time DC versus Heller rolls around, it's only a few decades old, but it's already been sub uh, subject to severe scholarly criticism for most of its brief lifespan. So... More of these pertaining to uh, Constitution, Founding Fathers. The Second Amendment is outdated. The Founding Fathers only had muskets. The amendment wasn't written for AR-15s. Thomas Jefferson wanted the Second Amendment to expire. Basically, all of this rhetoric implying that it's outdated and therefore invalid. So first, if the Second Amendment is outdated, then so is every amendment in the Bill of Rights, which means you have no freedom of speech, you have no freedom of religion, all that good stuff. Or if the Second Amendment is outdated specifically because the weapons that they had at the time that it was written were so different than what we have now, this argument is also flawed because it assumes that the framers were writing the Constitution, assuming that America would remain technologically retarded as the rest of the world develops more advanced technology. And we know that this is false because there were developments being made at the time with weapons that they were very aware of. It wasn't just muskets. They had magazine-fed repeating firearms dating back to at least the 1600s. You had pepper box handguns that fired five to seven shots without reloading. And those were in use by the end of the 18th century. Also, really quick, do want to note that in DC versus Heller in 2008, we just talked about that, the court did note that the Second Amendment extends to all instruments that are uh, that constitute bearable arms, even those that were not in existence at the time of the founding. So legally speaking, this argument has no ground. But more importantly, the language of the Constitution, even the punctuation, was so heavily debated that if they they really wanted to limit the people's firepower, they would have done it. They would have written the right of the people to keep and bear muskets, flintlock pistols, and swords, but they didn't. They wrote the right of the people to keep and bear arms because they want, well, the idea was to keep the people able to defend themselves. And so if the government had access to arms, but the citizens only had access to specific soon to be outdated muskets and pistols, that would be bad. So they consciously decided to keep the playing field level by just writing arms. And if our God-given rights don't stand the test of time because technology increases, then you don't have a right to complain about this on social media. Because, hey, Olivia, there's no way the Founding Fathers would have known about Facebook when they wrote the First Amendment. You don't have the right to speak on the phone without the government listening to you. There's no way the Founding Fathers would have ever known about phones when they wrote the Fourth Amendment. I'm realizing now that these are poor examples because we are being listened to in our homes and uh, on our phones and we're being censored online. So you get the point though. Rights are inalienable. Technological development is totally irrelevant. And with the Thomas Jefferson thing, oh, he wanted the Second Amendment to expire. Sort of, technically, yes. Just for clarification, Thomas Jefferson did not write the Second Amendment. He wasn't even in the country at the time. He was over in France doing some diplomatic stuff. I don't know why you'd ever want to be diplomatic with the French, but whatever, I'll leave my proclivities out of this. But James Madison is the man who actually wrote the language that was debated and sent to the states for ratification. What they're referring to from Jefferson is a letter that he penned to James Madison in September of 1789, in which he wrote that the earth belongs to the living generation. They can manage it as they please. And so therefore every constitution and every law should expire at the end of 19 years. If it be enforced longer, it is an act of force and not of right. That's paraphrased, but you get the point. But there's an important lesson here, which is that Jefferson lost. There's not much else we can say about it. I mean, we like Jefferson. Jefferson's top five, top three. But he was wrong here, and he lost. Most Americans, including James Madison, hoped that this new constitution would bring long-term stability to the United States. And that's exactly what happened. The Americans rejected this idea of the constitution as a living document in favor of it being carved in bedrock. But more importantly, since we're citing Thomas Jefferson as an authority, even if laws and constitutions were reviewed every 20 years, Jefferson would have never accepted anything less than the total security of and respect for the natural rights of mankind. He consistently affirmed this in his writings, particularly in the Declaration of Independence which is that the role of government is to protect our God-given rights. And if you disagree, if you're a government that didn't want to do that, that's fine. Thomas Jefferson would have just been like, oh, okay, you know, let's just overthrow it then, whatever. Like, it wasn't even a big deal to him. It was just, what a great generation that was, you know.
That's probably one of my favorite Jefferson quotes of all time. And it's relevant to this conversation of disarming citizens, and that is, the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. It is its natural manure. And he's also on record saying that, uh, I think in the same letter to William Smith, who is a London diplomat, uh, God forbid we should ever be 20 years without such a rebellion. Like, it's not even a question in his mind. Can you imagine if he were here? <laughs> People would be running up to him like, Mr. Jefferson, Mr. the federal government got involved in, Mr. They, the federal government did this, and he'd just be like, hmm. That's annoying. Uh, they've done all that since your last revolution, and you'd be like, well, not exactly. It'd be funny, but actually what that means is that if you're over 20 years old, Thomas Jefferson is frowning upon you because we haven't had any revolutions, but of course, I'm only joking. Totally sarcastic, ironic humor. Why would I want to overthrow the federal government? That would mean I'd have to stop watching The Office and drinking soy latte. So yeah, I think I'll pass on that one. Thank you, though. I disavow, I disavow revolutions. But back to the expiring after 20 years thing. That'd actually be cool because then we throw out every major gun law that's over 20 years old, National Firearms Act of 1934, Gun Control Act of 1968. Most state laws would disappear, and then reinstituting them wouldn't be as easy. And so we'd actually be a lot like the colonial America in the sense that, you know, we have a lot of guns, but very few laws restricting them. And that'd be pretty lit. So, you know, the last major argument in this category, I think, would be the Second Amendment is not an unlimited right. We'll explain why this is actually true, but I think that it's being used as sort of a Trojan horse for things that are not justified by this to take place. So none of our rights are unlimited, per se. We all know that there are restrictions on free speech. You can't incite violence or panic, things like that. And there are some restrictions on what you can do with your Second Amendment right. Justice Scalia wrote about this in his decision for D.C. versus Heller. He wrote that, like most rights, the right secured by the Second Amendment is not unlimited, that restrictions on the mentally ill or laws prohibiting the carry of firearms in sensitive places, such as schools and government buildings, are not unjust. Well, but John, gun-free zones are... Yeah, I know. Okay, I'm aware. One at a time. Because the point is that those are fairly reasonable restrictions. You're not mentally stable. At that point, you don't have the capacity to operate in a free society. Things like that are pretty reasonable. Where we start to get a little bit of the frog in the pan is that this line is repeated to justify measures that are completely and undeniably an infringement upon our Second Amendment rights. You know, all the way from banning concealed carry to banning certain types of rifles, that's all irrefutably unjust and a clear infringement upon our right to bear arms. And so when we say that the Second Amendment is not an unlimited right, we have to follow with, but it basically is. Like, we can't do anything we want, but we basically can. Same thing with free speech. Oh, I'm so bummed out that I can't yell fire in a crowded theater. Not really. Honestly, it doesn't affect my day-to-day -to -day too much. But I can do stuff like state the fact that the Prophet Muhammad was a pedophile. That's good enough for me. Can't do that in Europe. That's a thought crime over there. And this kind of gets into the argument that follows along the lines of, Oh, well, you don't have a right to own any gun that you want. You don't need an assault rifle. No reason to own military-grade firearms. The general phrase, automatic assault weapons, or just assault weapons, all that fun stuff. So with the, you don't have the right to own any gun that you want? Yeah, I basically do. I basically have the right to own any gun that I want. This is similar to what we just talked about because it's the same strategy of introducing a principle that we can agree on and then applying it to undermine the Second Amendment. We don't have the right to own any gun that we want. Maybe I can't put an MG nest in my bedroom window, but we basically can own any gun that we want. Constitutionally speaking, the courts have affirmed it. But what you're doing is you're using that to say that we shouldn't be able to own those rifles that you're so scared of, those, those automatic assault rifles. There's no reason you should own military-grade firearms. Now, some of us might disagree with that, but you're using that to try to take away non-military-grade weapons from American citizens. You think an AR-15 is a military-grade weapon? Are you slow? The whole point of the AR-15 is that it isn't a military weapon. Like, it's literally categorically excluded from being a military weapon. This is what I mean when I say they have no idea what they're talking about. Because they look at an M4 and an AR-15 and they're like, hmm, they look the same. Wait a minute, why should a civilian have a military weapon? And then, because everyone knows that the military uses fully automatic weapons, they believe that Americans have easy access to fully automatic weapons, they become even more afraid. Leftist politicians capitalize on that by ignoring that these rifles are semi-automatic and they just repeat that, well, automatic assault weapons. What the hell is an assault weapon? The AR-15 was developed in the late 1950s by a company named Armalite, which is what the AR stands for, not assault rifle, you idiots. And then they tried to sell it to the military. They failed. They sold the design to Colt in 1959. Then in 1963, the military selected Colt to manufacture an automatic version of the AR-15 rifle for the Vietnam War. That became the M16. The AR-15 predates the military's use of it. They had to make a version of it specifically for the military. Why is that? Because it's not a military-grade rifle. What's an assault weapon? Why are you using assault as a modifier for the word weapon? Is any firearm with which I assault someone an assault weapon? They banned so-called assault weapons in 1994 until 2004, which we'll talk about more later. 
Oh, and by the way, Australia's ban slash mandatory buyback was not shown to be statistically effective um, anyways. But here's my favorite part. Here's actual proof that the left wants assault weapons banned because they're scary. So by this time, automatic weapons were already banned via the Hughes Amendments in 1986. And so the assault weapons ban happens and the only weapons that are banned are only banned because of cosmetic features that in no way affect the functionality of the weapon. So in other words, if the gun looked scary, it was banned. Semi-automatic rifles that accept detachable magazines were banned if they had two or more features from this list. Folding or telescoping stock, pistol grip, bayonet mount, flash hider, or grenade launcher. But obviously, it'd be for aesthetic purposes since that's already illegal. Same idea with semi-automatic pistols. Not exactly the same classifications, but the same genre. So now, if you look at like an AR-15, you compare it to a Ruger Mini-14. One second. I'll be back. I had to get a visual aid. Look how scary this is. It's got the telescoping stock. It's got the pistol grip. That's two. So it's an assault weapon. And you guys got mad at me when I took the Garand down. I said I'd add more guns. I don't care. I'm based. And so here we are. Promises made. Promises kept, ladies and gentlemen. But this rifle right here, functionally identical to a Ruger Mini-14. Both magazine fed. Both can be chambered in 223. Functionally the same rifle. In fact, some people even argue that the Ruger is the better rifle. But the left wants to ban the AR because it looks different, which is probably racist or something, right? Like, where's the ACLU? Uh, same thing with the semi-automatic pistols. This was banned. The Tech 9s. And so that raises the question, you know, how can you ban a firearm that barely functions as a firearm? This thing is actually the least functional firearm that I own. It's basically just a novelty to me. But it was banned too because it has a magazine that attaches outside the pistol grip, or detaches rather. Um, and they actually banned this weapon by name in the bill. They said, nope, no Tech 9s, no clones, no nothing. And guess what happened? Columbine High School was shot up with a Tech 9 during the assault weapons ban. How did that happen? They were banned. It was also shot up with a 9mm carbine rifle that would not have even been classified as an assault weapon. How did that happen? I thought the assault weapons were the problem. Timothy McVeigh killed 168 people with fertilizer. How did that happen? I thought guns were the problem. No, do you know how easy it is to just make a bot? That's not what I, <laughs> no, no, no I, I disavow, not true, I don't know any, no, I'm sorry. Um, but as you can see, this is all arbitrary. They aren't addressing the real problem. I guess we're talking about the assault weapons ban now. So the Department of Justice funded a study on its effects in 2004 that concluded there was no evidence that it caused any decrease in gun violence, and there was no evidence that it saved any lives, none. And also that if it were reinstated, the effects would be so minimal that it would be hard to even assess it. That's what they concluded. The figure that people like Dianne Feinstein threw out, oh, it reduced gun murder 6.7%, that is false. That statistic is based on an assumption that was made in a 1997 study on the ban that turned out to be false. There's also no evidence that suggests it had any effect on mass shootings. The data often use different uh, metrics, so be careful with that. But if you use the most widely accepted metric, that it's a mass shooting, if four or more fatalities occur, then it had virtually no effect. The figure that's thrown out, that it led to a 37% decline in mass shooting fatalities. But the data from that figure include mostly mass shootings committed with handguns. This data says a mass shooting is six fatalities, and the author concedes that in the decade during the ban, there were only three qualifying shootings in his data set, and the decade before, there were five. That's statistically insignificant. The AR-15 alone. There's between 5 and 10 million of them in this country, very least amount. People even make their own guns in this country. They're not going away. And I'm confused by the intention of your legislation. You want to stop mass shootings. Most mass shootings are committed with handguns. Why are you going after the assault weapons? Assault weapons are more dangerous. The kid who shot up Virginia Tech, which is the third deadliest shooting in U.S. history, he killed 32 people using two of these, two semi-automatic handguns. One was a Glock like this, the other was a Walther or something like that. Uh, the FBI says gangs are responsible for almost half of all violent crime, also that all rifles, not just assault rifles, all rifles make up about 2.5% of murders and about 3.5% of gun murders in this country. In fact, people's hands and feet are used more often to murder than rifles are. Gun murders down 49% from the peak in 1993. Handguns are responsible for the vast vast majority of gun murders in this country. They say gun deaths so they can artificially inflate the number by including suicides. Why don't you want to ban handguns? Most mass shootings committed with handguns. What's the idea here? I'll tell you what the idea is. These people, believe it or not, they're not stupid. They're just lying to you. You think they actually don't know about the data? They know that banning these guns isn't going to do anything. They know that just as well as you and I know that. But more importantly, they know that most people don't know that. And they also know that most people become very emotional after these tragedies and they can't think coherently about public policy. And they also know that they can exploit that to their advantage because it will enable them to continue to chip away at your right to bear arms so that they can assert more power over you. That's the idea. So when you're sitting there thinking to yourself, just, well, now wait a minute. If they wanted to stop people from getting shot, why would they go after the rifles? Hardly anyone ever gets shot with a rifle. And, and, and why would they set up gun-free zones? Doesn't that just make people a target? And you know, this just doesn't make any sense, correct? It doesn't have to. It doesn't have to make sense. That's not the point. The point is not to solve the problem. It's to chip away at your rights. You're thinking about it in the wrong frame of mind, and you shouldn't be. At least that's what history suggests. And uh, 
regarding this. Oh, you don't need an assault rifle. You don't need to own that. Yeah, you don't need to be running your fat, stupid mouth at me about shit that you clearly know nothing about, but yet here you are. The point is that you don't need to provide a reason to exercise a right. ARs have been used countless times in self-defense to stop mass shootings, stop home invasions with multiple intruders. None of that even matters because I don't have to justify my right to you. If you don't think I need an AR-15, come and take it, big guy, but you, you won't. You'd rather have the government do it for you, as with everything else. That's literally all the government can do, just things that we don't do or won't do. So if you won't take responsibility for your own safety by arming yourself, now I have to be disarmed along with everyone else? Yeah, I don't know about that one. We've seen what happens to people that aren't armed. Never goes well. And as far as what the actual cause of these mass shootings is, um, I have a separate video on that that I'll link below. So. You can check that out. But moving on, high capacity magazines should be banned because of mass shootings. The general phrase, high capacity magazine. What, what's a high capacity magazine? That implies that there's a standard capacity magazine, which I'd say is true, but I would say that 30 rounds is standard capacity. High capacity, yeah, okay, compared to what? Compared to the little 10 round magazines in California? Yeah, that really put a dent in their gun violence, hasn't it? Good job, great success, very nice. Uh, here's the truth, 30 rounds, that's standard. 40 rounds, probably extended. Anything above that, high capacity. But what does that even matter? There's already millions in circulation. They're not going away. You're not gonna stop mass shootings. Best case scenario, you slightly inconvenience the shooter. But again, not likely because there's so many of these magazines in circulation already. But they know this. They already know this. What this is really about is just imposing arbitrary regulations that continue to chip away at your rights. That's really the point here because they never stop. That's the whole point of leftism. They're trying to eliminate what we're trying to conserve. Okay, fine, no more than 10 rounds. Oh, wait, mass shootings still happen. Okay, now eight, now five, now no semi-automatic weapons, which they're already calling for. You you think they just stop after banning 30 round magazines that they just pack it up and go home? No, they wouldn't. And they haven't. Remember how we just had to ban bump stocks? Republicans caved. Nothing happened. But we've seen, you know, we've lost a pawn now. We're down a piece on the board and it's not coming back. That's really the effect of this little stuff because honestly, I don't really care about bump stocks. You wanna have one? Cool, have fun. But what bump stocks did was occupy space in the debate. From a strategic standpoint, bump stocks were a good point of defense for us because we could hold them back there to keep them from going after things that really matter. Things like magazines, semi-automatic actions, whatever. But now because our leadership is incompetent and doesn't understand that leftism is a machine that by design and purpose can never stop, now we're defending from a less advantageous ground. We've had to retreat. Now, okay, they got the bump stocks. Now they can focus their energy on magazines or whichever is next. That's why you can never concede because the concession is temporary. You always have to hold your ground because if you don't, pretty soon you'll find yourself arguing why you should have a right to own a handgun in your home for self-defense. And you'll just be wishing that you would care a bit more when they came for the little stuff. We have to hold them at the gates. But of course, we're told, oh, well, no one's trying to take your guns away. Hitler didn't take the guns. Dictators don't take guns. Calm down, you're paranoid, etc." So, as far as no one trying to take my guns away, I own guns classified as assault weapons. They're advocating for mandatory buyback enforced by sending police door to door if necessary. So yes, by definition, they actually are in fact trying to take my guns and they're trying to take your guns too. And I think that watching them for the last few years freak out about how Trump is Hitler and the government is being taken over by fascists, I think that's really revealing because it shows just how compartmentalized leftist thought really is because obviously, if Trump really were a dictator similar to Adolf Hitler, you'd want to own as many guns as possible to stop him, but they don't. They actually want the opposite. And it's because they just believe whatever the media tells them to believe without question. They don't actually reason it through for themselves. That's why we're often wrong when we say to ourselves, what? How can they believe so many things that just contradict each other? They're so stupid, not necessarily. They just haven't actually thought for themselves about it, which you could argue is a symptom of stupidity, but such is life. I mean, just look at Britain. They used to have gun rights, but then slowly but surely, law by law, they were stripped away starting 1870. You need a license to carry a firearm outside of your home. Oh, okay, 1903 Pistols Act says no guns for the drunk or mentally insane, plus you need a license to purchase a handgun. Oh, okay, 1920 Firearms Act ushers in a registration system that gives police the power to deny license to anyone unfit to be trusted with a firearm. Oh. Okay, 1937, they update the Firearm Act to raise the minimum age to buy a gun, banning automatic weapons, giving police more power to regulate licenses. The Home Secretary rules that self-defense is no longer a valid reason to be granted a gun certificate. Oh, okay, 1967, now you have to get a license to buy a shotgun. Oh, okay, 1968, now you have to pay a fee for a shotgun license and also show good reason for carrying guns and ammo. Oh, okay, 1988, they amend the Firearms Act to ban semi-automatic and pump-action rifles and also mandated registration of shotguns. Oh, all right. 1997, they amend the Firearms Act again, this time banning essentially all handguns. Oh, okay, okay, that's fine. Who cares? They arrest thousands of people for being mean online now, and I can't walk to get a cup of coffee, or a cup of tea, rather, because they're 
f***ing British without being stabbed six times. But hey, who cares? I'll show you exactly what they're trying to do. This is prophetic. Take my word for it. Let's look at Eric Swalwell, whatever his name is. His plans for guns that the media praise. He wants to mandate a 48 hour cooling off period between when you can purchase and take possession of a gun, implement background checks for ammunition purchases, require that you purchase liability insurance when you purchase, transfer, or otherwise receive a gun. He wants to create a national firearms registry to be linked to individual firearms. He wants to prohibit you from purchasing more than one handgun in a 30 day period, prohibit the online sale of ammunition, completely ban and buy back, which means we're gonna take it, but we'll throw you a couple bucks if you want. And if you say no, we're gonna shoot your dog. He wants to ban bump stocks, magazines that hold more than 10 rounds, and, quote, silencers. Prohibit individuals from hoarding ammunition in quantities that exceed 200 rounds per caliber or gauge. So no more buying 1,000 round cans of ammo, because apparently that's hoarding. I'll be honest. The first time I read that, I actually laughed aloud, because 200 rounds, that's not hoarding. I've seen people that actually hoard ammo to the point where it's like, all right, man, this is just superfluous. Like, you need to calm down. Like, the baby boomers... They were so scared of Obama, they'd go dry up the supply of ammo from all the gun stores, which ended up keeping the price of uh, per round artificially high during that whole administration. That was funny. But really, the idea here is to make it such a headache to own a gun that the average person just says, screw it, and they just give up. You have to understand, people like us, the come and take it types of people, they know they're not going to stop us. But we're an extreme minority. So when they can convince the average person that owning a gun is too much of a hassle, they'll be able to then say, you know what, we may as well just ban these guns because no one really is using them anymore. No one even, no one really cares anymore. It's not even a big issue. And by that point, the electorate will be in their favor because they will have lulled the average person into just giving up on their right to bear arms by making it too much of a hassle for them. And they say that it's a myth that Hitler took the guns, which is partially true. Basically, what you need to recognize is that dictators like to disarm people so that they can rule over them without serious conflict. Germany already had pretty strict gun laws as a result of the Weimar Republic passing laws in 1928 that only allowed for gun licenses to be given to people whose reliability is not in doubt and only after providing or proving a need for them. Um, it also prohibited gun possession for anyone who, quote, has acted in an ill manner towards the state or is uh, to be feared that will, they will endanger public security or whatever. And then in 1931, an emergency decree authorized the German states to register all firearms, which could be confiscated if, quote, public security and order so requires. Then when the Nazis took power in 1933, these existing laws were used to conduct massive searches and seizures of firearms from political opponents of the Nazis. Then after the Reichstag fire, they suspended civil liberties like freedom of the press, uh, free speech, freedom of assembly, and all as an emergency measure. And so the Nazis used their existing laws to their advantage because they classified their enemies, particularly communists and Jews, as dangerous to the public safety, which made disarming them perfectly legal. And they already had the firearms registry because of the Weimar Republic, and so disarming the people was fairly simple. And then in 1938, Hitler revised the Weimar law to exclude Jews from firearms business, banned 22 caliber hollow points, stipulate that anyone could be disarmed on the basis of public security. So when they actually say that Hitler lose it, uh, loosened gun laws, that's correct in a way because he made it easier for loyal Germans to acquire guns, but definitely not communists or Jews. What was a consequence of the Jews being disarmed? The night of the broken glass in 1938, on which Jewish homes and shops were ransacked, synagogues were, synagogues were burned, excuse me, thousands of Jewish men were thrown into concentration camps. The fact is that Hitler used existing gun laws to consolidate power and then attack his political opponents. They took the guns in Russia after the communists got power in 1918. Mao, Pol Pot, Castro, I mean, it's a very recognizable pattern, an avoidable pattern. And you can even find the quotes from these people. Like, they were very aware of what they were doing. Mao said that all political power comes from the barrel of a gun. Stalin said that if the opposition disarms, well and good, but if it refuses to disarm, we will disarm it ourselves. Not too often does this have good consequences. And this is where... They say, oh, well, do you actually think you would win against the military? LMAO. You think you're going to win with your little rifle? LOL, dumb conservative, the military would crush a civilian rebellion. I know you think you're arguing against guns, but you're actually not. That's an argument in favor of more civilian gun ownership. The government would crush you guys. You, really? You think so? Oh man, all right, I guess I better go buy more guns. Uh, you're not even asking the correct question. The correct question is not, would the government destroy civilian resistance to being disarmed? The correct question is, would the government of a country with more guns than people, and whose people buy more guns in two months than the entire military has on hand, and the average guns per person figure raising every day, would that government even try? And the correct answer is no, that government would never try. You think you can fight off the government with your little AR-15? No, I think me and the boys spot the alphabet boys stacked up outside. We start blasting the This Is Little Pump playlist off Spotify from a dangerously loud speaker system so they can't hear anything. And then 
you know, we open the door, we go downstairs, we open the door, we say, hello, ATF, would you like to listen to This Is Little Pump with us while you take all of our guns away? We even got pizza and Mountain Dew for double XP weekend. That's what would happen. Nothing bad. Obviously, totally compliant. I don't know why everyone gets so uptight about that. So you're saying that if the government tried to take your guns, you'd actually disobey them and fight back? Yes! And that's the thing, even if I wouldn't, which I honestly don't know that I would, you know, we can all sit here and we can say, oh, I'm so tough and I'd fight the government and I'd be, you know, shut up. You know, you really don't know how you'd react. But I can say with 100% certainty that some people would resist and that word would get out and they'd have a serious problem because right now we're so numb. We're so accustomed to this cookie cutter, nine to five, two cream, two sugar lifestyle that it's like, wait, what, resist tyranny? But I have work tomorrow. I can't, I can't do that. There's, there's a breed of men though out there still that are willing and ready to do do this and die on that hill. And I know because a lot of them follow me and the government knows that too. They know that these are the types of people that would break the marginal citizens out of their conditioning. And no, I'm not gonna apologize for stating the fact that if you try to disarm people, they're going to fight you. Don't infringe upon our rights, you'll be good to go. Don't tread on me, please. I'll even ask nicely, please don't. But moving forward, um, a lot of the arguments that they make are based on data that are either totally false or misleading. And so we'll go through some of those right now um, and those would be claims like less guns equal less gun deaths or the opposite, which would be more guns equal more gun deaths. Um, these types of things are why I think that everyone should have to take a statistics class in high school because the implication here is that where there are more guns, there are more gun deaths, therefore the guns are causing the gun deaths. What if the case was where there are areas of high amounts of gun violence? People are more likely to want to own guns to defend themselves, thereby increasing the level of gun ownership. Is that a possibility? Let's say you've got 20 people in a city doing quite a lot of murdering and people read the news and they're like, you know what, I think I would prefer to not get murdered. So they go buy a gun. The media would look at this relationship and, oh, more guns, more gun death, ah! And so that, you know, it's not that simple. Do you know which state has the most murders? August, uh, well, the most gun murders adjusted for population. It's not really a state, but it's DC, it's Washington DC. Gun ownership in DC, 26%. Their gun murder rate per 100,000 is 16.5. And I actually took the liberty of organizing this data myself because I couldn't find anything reliable when I looked. And so I, um, I farmed data from the FBI and the Census Bureau because just saying more guns means more gun deaths. That's not only a misleading statistic because they count suicides as gun deaths, which we'll talk about more in a second, but um, it doesn't take into account population and the proportion of that population that's actually committing the murder. And so. I spent like 45 minutes entering all this data I found into Google Sheets. I made this nifty little chart that compares the percentage of the population of each state that owns guns to the gun homicide rate per 100,000 of that state. In statistics, we refer to this as no f***ing correlation. If anything, though, that blue line, the regression line, you can see that it trends slightly upward as the gun homicide rate decreases and trends slightly downward. So if anything, the conclusion to be drawn is that more guns actually equals less gun murder. And the reasoning for that is that gun ownership is a deterrent to crime. People don't want to be shot. Even the mass shooters overwhelmingly target gun-free zones. Criminals want the path of least resistance. Guns are resistance. And so according to the data from the FBI and the Census Bureau, there's no statistically significant relationship between gun ownership and gun murders. Now, regarding suicides, I took the proportion of gun ownership that I had already got um, state by state, and I compared that to the suicide rate to see if we could establish a relationship between the two. And I did actually find somewhat of a relationship between the two, but I don't think it's the guns that cause the suicide. I mean, our depression rates are sky high. Did the guns cause those too? I think what it probably is, is that states with a higher proportion of gun ownership, think the rural states, they've been disproportionately affected by things like structural unemployment and the opiate epidemic. And Obviously, guns are going to be a more lethal method of suicide than some of these other methods, but the USA ranks 34th in the world for our suicides per 100,000. And the countries above us, countries like Japan, Russia, India, Belgium, countries where it's a lot more difficult to obtain a firearm, they're still committing suicide. Also, it's the same principle of just because someone decides to do something wrong does not mean that I ought to be stripped of my rights. I have done nothing wrong. Two thirds of gun deaths are suicides in this country. That's why they say gun deaths and not gun homicides. They're trying to artificially inflate the problem to garner more emotionally based rhetoric. I really want to hurry this up because my brain is starting to hurt. So the next one is that uh, guns are rarely used in self-defense. Armed citizens are unlikely to stop crimes. The good guy with a gun theory is a myth. Also, um, gun control saves lives. No, the good guy with a gun theory is not a myth. Citizens use legally owned guns in self-defense or to stop crimes every day. Not only do we have specific instances like when they stop mass shootings, but we also have data. And the CDC published a study in 2013 that estimates it happens between 500,000 and 3 million times every year. FSU found that it's about 2.5 million. These are 
big numbers. That doesn't exactly expel myths or rare to me. It's very common. And we don't even know about the deterrence factor because we don't have any way of measuring that. We can't account for someone that was going to commit a crime but then didn't because they feared targeting an armed citizen. We've got about 15,000 murders per year. Of those, 10,000 are with a gun. The conclusion to be drawn is that guns are a net life saver. Guns save lives. And again, none of this even matters because you have an inalienable right to self-preservation. It's time to talk about guns. No, it's not. We had that talk in the late 18th century. We're all done with that now. We can move on. Gun control now. No, not gun control now. Next one. It's not a mental health issue. Stop stigmatizing mental health. The left is trying to get this conversation away from mental health because they love promoting mental health awareness so that they can pathologize the human experience and put you on drugs. I did a video on this issue that's talking um, about what's causing these tragedies to happen. It's in the description if you want to watch it. Here's one from Trevor Noah. Uh, he says that, you know, we restrict liberty to save lives with cars. Why not with guns? Here's why. Driving is a privilege. Gun ownership is a right. And because of that, even though gun control has been proven to be ineffective everywhere it's been tried in this country, it doesn't even matter because at the end of the day, it's my right. And another thing, we already restrict liberty to a certain degree pertaining to the Second Amendment. You can't own certain types of weapons. You can't take them certain places, etc. So perhaps your complaint is actually evidence of the fact that restricting gun access isn't actually going to solve your problem. I'm running out of steam here, to be honest. I'm going to try to finish these quickly. Um, so a majority of adults support common sense gun laws. Uh, if you're arguing that because a majority supports something, then it's okay. You're wrong. Justice is objectively de defined. You know, a majority of this country is more than welcome to forfeit their right to keep and bear arms if they perceive that to be the solution to the problem. But that does not mean that they can force me to forfeit my right, uh, my rights in order to follow suit with them. We have a mass shooting epidemic. No, we don't. It's actually stayed about the same since we started tracking this data. What's changed is the media coverage, which is just inspiring more of these people to commit these atrocities. But the media doesn't care because the ratings are good for them. And you can tell that the agenda is sinister because they cover the story beyond the point of news. Like they continue to cover the story well after it has reached everyone because they want to politicize it to fit their narrative, which is really what this whole issue is. But again, if you're still watching this, by the way, thank you because we've been at this for a minute. None of these petty arguments about data or emotion, none of them matter because at the end of the day, you have a right to keep and bear arms and nothing will ever change that. So that's basically it. You know, I'm going to go buy another gun or something. I'm bored with this. You know, we, we, we don't have a second amendment to go defend the second, well, like, <laughs> we don't have a second amendment to defend the second amendment verbally. We have a second amendment to exercise it, you know. I'm doing a lot of first amendment here. I feel like I've been neglecting my second amendment even though I'm technically exercising it right now. But I wanna go play with, you know, I wanna go shoot a gun or something. This is dumb, this is, this is stupid. This whole, ban guns, shut up, you know, it's, shut up. They never, that's the other thing. They never want to, Every leftist that I've ever had a gun debate with is like, hey, you know what? Why don't you come to a shooting range with me? You know, let's let's just go shoot a gun. You see, you know, see see how you like it. Never, not once. So, hey guys, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Also, we're getting close to breaking a hundred thousand. So if you want to help speed that up, because there are big plans at a hundred thousand, you can share this video with all your friends. I really appreciate that. That'd be uh, that'd be pretty cool of you. Um, also, subscribe if you haven't already, and leave me a comment. Let me know what you think. I know I missed argument. I mean, obviously, I can't actually go through every argument and just be here forever, and then I wouldn't get to wouldn't get to exercise my Second Amendment because I'd too, be too busy exercising my First Amendment. So that's not a that's not a lifestyle I want to live. Not too comfortable with that. So thank you so much for watching, and may God bless America.